to ask you a question. How many of you have ever lost something before, like a credit card? It, ooh, your fear hits. I have this clear credit card. Whenever I hand it to people, it's like, oh, a clear credit card. I've never seen it before. But it's interesting. I've lost that card maybe four or five times. Thank you, American Express. We appreciate that. Don't judge me, Dave Ramsey. But I do have a card for emergencies. I've lost credit cards. What about you've lost the remote control? We're going to see how spiritual you are, okay? And then let's just keep it real. The torture of our day, the anger of our day, if you lose your phone charger, look out. I mean, you talk about faith fights, fist fights in our home. Like, where's my charger? You stole my charger. I'm like, yeah, that's what I did to all my teenage kids over the years. I'm like, I get up every morning and think, how can I frustrate my teenager? I'm going to go take their charger. That'll get them. That'll show them. But we do lose things, and I lose things. You lose things. Turn to your neighbor real quick and just say, I know you've lost something before. And that's what I want to talk to you about today, about losing something. I want to go back, back, back to the Old Testament and to the book of Kings, 2 Kings. And I want to talk to you about 650 years, give or take, from when Jesus was alive. And to kind of give you the cliff notes, the backstory, we know God's people, God used some great leaders. And then the people decided, hey, God, we want a king. We, we want to pick a king. We want to vote for a king. I think there's something about voting coming up this week. But we want to pick a king. And God's like, well, I'm your king. If you pick them, they're going to tax you. They're going to take some of your stuff. And so the people still, we want a king. We want a king. So God gave them a king. The first king was Saul. It didn't go so well for Saul because Saul started following God. But then he kind of quickly said, you know what? I, I kind of want to lead my own way. And it didn't work out well for Saul. Then after Saul was David. David was a man after God's own heart. David had a lot of flaws. We all have a lot of flaws. Turn to your neighbor and say, I know you got a few flaws, at least a few. We all have flaws. And so no one is perfect except Jesus. And after Saul, there was David. David followed God. He served God's purpose for his generation. And then after David, he had a son named Solomon. Solomon was the guy who said, above all else, guard your heart. It's the wellspring of life. It, it determines where your life goes, what goes into your mind, what goes into your heart. And Solomon, he served God after he didn't serve God. And then after that, History Lesson 101 is he had these two sons, Rehoboam and Jeroboam. And what they did is they kind of went really rogue. They took the nation of Israel and they split it in two. And they named it Israel in the north, Judah in the south. I mean, can you imagine in the state of Illinois, if we divided, there was a northern state and a southern state. All the people in the middle say... We'll go to the south. We'll go to the south. People in Illinois got excited for a moment. Like, are we voting on this? Is this on the referendum? But they picked, and a lot of kings were in the north and in the south, and a lot of them ducked God's dynasty. God wants to create dynasties and legacies, but when you go your own way, you often pay, and it costs you what you don't want to pay. And so what happened was, after all these kings and these nations had split, there was a guy who was a king, and then he, the grandpa wasn't a good guy. The dad wasn't a good guy. He was assassinated. And then we pick up the story in 2 Kings chapter 22, verse 1. After his dad was assassinated, it says that Josiah was eight years old when he became king. Let's say Josiah all together. One, two, three, Josiah. Well, what a name. What a cool name. A great name. But can you imagine having an eight-year-old become king? become president of the United States of America, Fortnite every day, <laughs> McDonald's French fries for everyone, limited school days when you want to go, you know what I'm saying? But he was eight years old, he became king, and he was made for the moment. Verse two, it says, he did what was pleasing in the Lord's sight, and he did not turn away from what was, what was right, from doing what was right. So you have this young king, now he's got a lot of help, but he's doing the right thing. Well, eventually he came to the place where he said, I want to rebuild the temple. We want to make sure it looks nice. We want to repair it. We want to restore it. So often people forget the generosity that has happened in this church. If you go back many years from the start of this church, almost 16 years ago, and then you have the Beyond Campaign where a lot of people sacrificed and gave and people who want to make a difference for their heart for the house and create a legacy. Hey, thank you for your generosity. If Come on, let's thank these people for their generosity. A lot of people, even before we were ever here, sacrificed 
so that you could be sitting in a seat to experience life change. That happens because people say, hey, I have a higher calling. My, my, I'm not building my treasures here on planet Earth. I'm, I'm storing up treasures in heaven. The greatest treasures in heaven are people. And so we have to provide places where people can experience God. And so many people have done that and you've given generously. And I just, as, as your pastor, Danielle and I, our team, we thank you for that. Thank you for your generosity. Well, Josiah, he wanted to restore the temple. So they started restoring the temple and then something interesting happened. It says in verse eight, Hilkiah, the high priest, said to Shaphan, we'll call him Shap, the court secretary, he said, I have found the book. So they're restoring this temple. They're cleaning it. Everything must go. They're getting rid of the junk stuff. You know what I'm talking about? How many of you have done that? How many of you forgot to do that this last year? Well, it comes in the spring, so you got a while to go. But he said, I found the book of the law in the Lord's temple. Verse 10, so Shap, he read it to the king. And when he read this to the king, the king was feeling terrible, terrible. He tore his royal robe, which was a sign of, you're pretty ticked off. I won't tear my clothes for you today, but he was pretty mad. And he said, this is terrible news. Like, what do we do now? So they're, they're just doing this cl spring, fall cleaning thing. And they find this book, which was probably the book of Deuteronomy or the first five books of the Old Testament. And Josiah gets it. And they're reading this book, and Josiah's like, this is not good. This is not good at all, because we haven't been doing this. And in verse 13, it says, For the Lord's great anger is burning against us, because our ancestors have not obeyed. We have not been doing everything it says we must do. So what did Josiah do? Josiah, thank you for asking, Josiah went and found this prophetess, this woman, Holda. I mean, that's a name. She had a passion for fashion. She was the wardrobe maker so she was a fashion designer, a maker, and she said, hey, I have some news. Like, you, you responded, you did the right thing, Josiah, but some bad things are going to happen after you live. And so Josiah, he didn't minimize the sin, but he's responsive. He actually responds to the sin. Instead of just going, oh, man, those guys were idiots. They didn't do it. No, he actually responds and decides to do something about it. And today, if we've lost this sense of responding to God's word, we need to go back to it. And I want to ask you, how quickly do you respond to God's word? When you hear the word of God, when you hear the truth, do you respond or do you sit back and go, you know what? I'll think about that. Because in verse 19 and 20, 22, it says, because you took this seriously, because you took it seriously, Josiah, you took this seriously, the doom of judgment, because you responded in humble repentance, tearing your robe in dismay and weeping before me, I'm taking you seriously. This is the message translation. I love it. It's kind of like street language for the Bible. But God's word says, I'll take care of you. I'll take care of you. What a great reminder for someone today, someone watching online. God will take care of you. He'll take care of your children. He'll take care of your health. He'll take care of your finances. He'll take care of the broken parts of your life. He'll help you with addictions. He'll help you with freedom. He'll help you with anxiety. He'll help you with doubt. He'll help you with depression. He'll help you if you ask him. First Peter 5, 7, I love that verse. It says, give all your worries and cares to God because, it doesn't just say give them to him. And then the phrase after that, because he cares for you. If anyone knew that, it was Peter. Peter was the guy who rebelled against God, who was a traitor, who disloyal, was disloyal to Jesus. And in the moment when Jesus needed him the most, remember he was like, I'll fight for you. No one's gonna kill you. You're our savior. You're our, you're our leader. And then when Jesus was taken, he gave his life up. When the rooster crowed three times, Peter locked eyes with Jesus and he knew he had betrayed him. And then Jesus in his kindness and his mercy would restore him and say, upon this rock, I'm gonna build my church. Peter, he's gonna use Peter, the guy who betrayed Jesus. So you're never too far from God, no matter what you've done, no matter what you've said, no matter what you've, you've felt. You're like, man, I know that God loves me. He has to love me because he's God. No, hey, God loves you. He has a purpose for your life. You were made for purpose, on purpose, and he's got great things in store for your life. Does anybody believe that today? I, I believe that. So he'll care for you. So I think we need to, what happened to Josiah needs to happen with us. And I'm gonna give you just a simple phrase. I believe this, this talk is something that is needed more than ever in our day. We live in a biblically illiterate culture and we need to go back and we need to do what Josiah did. What did Josiah do, if you think about it? He read the book, but first he found the book. 
and then he did what it said. He found a book, he read a book, and he did what it said. And I wonder if our lives, if we would actually find the book, read the book, and do what it says, if good things would happen in our life. Kind of sounds like a nursery rhyme. Let's try it all together, ready? Find the book, read the book, do what it says. Now turn to your neighbor, say, find the book, read the book, do what it says. One more time for the people in the back. Find the book, read the book, do what it says. It's kind of a little nursery rhyme, like, find the book, okay. Where's God's word? Has it been dusty in your life? Go find it, read it. Read the book, actually read the book. Read the book out loud. If you want God to speak to you, if you wanna hear God's voice, read it out loud. This is God's voice to you. God used over 40 authors, over 1600 years, different continents to write the word of God. This is not some intellectual book that we decipher it and dissect it. No, this is the word of God. This is God's love letter to you and to me. We find this book, we read this book, and then ultimately we have to do what it says. If we just find the book, man, I've got a Bible. I always laugh with my kids from time to time if they leave the doors open. I'm like, what are they gonna do? They're gonna break into a pastor's house, steal a couple pairs of shoes, and be like, wow, let's take this guy's expensive book collection. <gasps> it's just a bunch of Bibles. They're gonna make, we picked the wrong house, man. We picked the wrong house. We've got a bunch of Bibles. And sometimes I'll see the different versions of the Bibles that we have. Which version, I get asked this question for time, which version of the Bible should I read? Well, if you wanna be grammatically technical, it's not the King James Version. It's not the ESV. It's not the Young's Literal Translation. You should probably read, if you're that person, because there's always that person, which Bible is the most accurate and correct? Well, you should read the Hebrew, the Greek, and the Aramaic. That's what you should read. And then we see the Bible as it's translated from the King James Version, the ESV, NIV. These, these, the text tells us the truth. Like, they're not changing the meaning of what the Bible says. You should read the version of the Bible that you're gonna actually do. That's the version you should read. I read the New Living Translation, the ESV, the King James Version. I'll even throw in the ICB, the International Children's Bible, because sometimes God wants us to come to him with faith like a child. And the Bible's written for a seventh grader. You can read it. If you're in sixth grade, you're on the borderline. But seventh grade, you can understand the Bible interprets itself. Yeah, you need to learn. You need to read the notes and study it. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, this book is about changing and transforming our hearts. And so we have to ask ourselves, are we finding the book? As a follower of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is the authority for your life. You have to get under it. And I often use this illustration, get under the word of God. You have to submit. That is a military term. That means to get under. Are you really under the word of God? Are you kind of, then most people live their life like this. Like, I'm equal with the word of God. Like, yeah, I've, people have wronged me. So I'm gonna give revenge back to them. You went through a difficult divorce. Oh, they made you pay? Oh, you'll make them pay. No, the Bible's actually, Brian, when people wrong you, forgive them. We have to find this book. Can I encourage you? Find a Bible reading plan. Pick a time, pick a place. Many people who are not reading the word of God, it's what really changes the course of your life. People that read their Bible over four times a week, it really changes depression, loneliness. It changes you wanna live a pure life. It changes you wanna serve God. It changes you wanna be generous with your life. When you read the word of God, I wanna encourage you, don't judge yourself, don't feel bad, don't feel guilty, but today, hey, walk out of here going, you know what? I want God's word to change my life. The only thing that's gonna change your life is God's word. Anything I have to say about my random stories, it's really not gonna change your life. The word of God is what's gonna change your life. You gotta find the book. You have to read the book. The thing about this is when you read it, it's scary because it reads you. When you read the book, the book reads you. When you read the book, the book reveals you. It reveals who you are and it reveals who you could be. Because you and I, Ephesians tells us, we are created to do great works. We're created to do great things for God, great things for others. And this book reveals what's really inside of us. And so we'll either become more like the world, and if you've noticed our world, it's gone a little bit crazy 
over the last four years, and the four years before that, and the four years before that. And the people who understand this stuff are believers because we know what happens in this book. If you're on Team Jesus, you win. I don't wanna be on the losing team. If you're on Team Jesus, you know that the world and the culture will get darker and darker, yet the church will shine brighter and brighter. I mean, around this world, we see the church. I know in America, we're, we're so comfortable and cozy, but around the world, the church is flourishing. Underground churches are flourishing. People who are being persecuted for their faith, people whose lives are on the line for their faith are being persecuted. And their churches are growing because their passion for the Lord, they realize that this life is not all that they're living for. We, we've seen the church kind of blend with the world. And is there difference between the way you live your life, by the way you're generous with your life, by the way you forgive others with your life, by the way that you love others with your life? Is there a difference between your life and the world? Or really you're like, man, I kind of do what everybody else does. Except the only difference is I show up for an hour at church. Or, hey, wait a second, I have the word of God in my life. I'm actually praying for my church. I'm praying for God to use me. I'm praying for our community. I'm praying for lost people. I'm praying for God to change and move in my life. I mean, I don't wanna live a life where I don't see God do something unbelievable and amazing. That's, that's, that's what I'm living for. I wanna see people's lives change by the gospel. My life was changed by the gospel. And if I was living a purposeless life on a hill in the middle of nowhere, and God can come to some people who are nice and change their life, he can radically change your life. And I believe that. Yet the word of God, we have to read it. And we have to ultimately be what we wanna see. Judges 21, verse 25, it said, there was a day in Judges when they were directionally challenged. It says that they, all the people did whatever seemed right in their own eyes. So we have to change that culture, church. We have to go, you know what? We're not gonna do whatever just seems right in our own eyes. We're gonna go back to the word of God and actually do what it says. We find the book, we read the book, we do what it says. That's what Josiah did. Josiah actually went on this thing. He, he responded to the sin and said, you know what? We're not gonna minimize it. We're not gonna make excuses. We're actually gonna do something about it. And you talk about the ultimate cleanse. You know, one of those cleanse. As you get older, the word cleanse comes into play. You need a water cleanse, a lemon cleanse. All the students are like, what? Gross. But Josiah went on this unbelievable cleanse, this campaign cleanse. He went to all these cities and he took out all the idols, all the immorality. He went city to city up to 100 miles or more, just started wiping out these altars that people had built to sacrifice to God, sex gods. Before you know it, there's child sacrifice that was happening. And we, we, we hear that and we're like, ah, we're not, we're not sacrificing our children Yet, church, I would say that that is one of the biggest things we're doing in our culture that is wrong. We're telling our kids, kind of do whatever you want to do. We're, we're taking the lives of innocents, ones in the womb. You don't think we're doing child sacrifice today? That's a biblical thing. We have a culture and we have an enemy who's evil. He wants to still kill and destroy. He's stealing dreams and I believe we've already killed the cure for cancer and a lot of other diseases in the womb. Some of the greatest doctors who never came to life because they were aborted when they were a baby. And I don't think that that's God's plan. I think that's wicked. I think it's evil. I think it's wrong. I think the judgment of God is gonna come. It is coming. And we look, on the, look around our world and our culture. I know this is an exciting message, isn't it? When you talk about the judgment of God. Yet God in his goodness, if we humble ourselves, repent and turn from our sins, the Bible says that God would heal our land. I wanna be a part of seeking God, repenting for my sins, turning to him, seeking his face, praying, and that God would heal my land. That's, what, that's the solution I wanna be a part of. Is that the solution you wanna be a part of? So very quickly, Josiah, he went on this campaign cleanse. He got, off, got the wrong people out, the wrong stuff out. Some of us, we need to go into our houses and ask ourselves, do we have the right stuff? Are we allowing the right things? This isn't a legalistic talk. This is a, hey, what, what are you allowing into your home? What are you allowing into your own heart? We wanna judge the world, yet God's judgment always starts with the house of God. That's not a popular phrase. God wants to start and clean some things in your heart, some attitudes in your heart, some greed in your heart, some selfishness in your heart. 
This whole series is called Follow. Jesus said, whoever wants to be my disciple would pick up their cross and follow me. Not go their own way, but follow his way. It's about following him. It says in verse 23, verse three, it says the king, he stood in the presence. He stood in the presence of the people. After all this stuff, he realized, well, we are not doing this. He stood with the people in the presence of the Lord. And he said to follow the Lord and keep his commands. Then all the people pledged themselves to the covenant. So they did a Passover. They remembered Passover. Passover when God rescued his people from Israel. And Josiah said, hey, we're gonna stand. We're actually gonna kind of recommit ourselves to following the word of God. And we see in Josiah's life, he did some amazing things because he chose to find the book, read the book, and actually do what it says. See, if we just read the book and we don't do what it says, James 2.20 says, faith without action, without deeds, is useless. So if you have faith, you're like, I have faith in God, I have faith in God. But without actions, it's actually useless. If you hear the word of God and you forget to do what it says, you're actually deceiving yourselves. Are you deceiving yourself? When you come to church, are you like, I'm excited for the word of God. I hear the word of God. And then I walk out and I don't do it. I've done that. I'll raise both hands. But we're just deceiving ourselves. We have to hear the word of God. We let it come into our minds, into our hearts. Say, God, if there's anything you need to change, change it. God, if there's a step of faith I need to do, if I'm greedy and I need to be generous, okay, God, today I'm gonna break the back of greed. Okay, God, if I need to be kind, I'm gonna go out of my way to be kind. If I need to forgive someone, God, I'm gonna forgive them. I'm gonna let go. Does it mean what they did to me is right? Absolutely not. But I'm gonna let God deal with people because I want God to deal with me gently when I'm stupid, when I'm dumb, when I try to minimize my sin or make excuses for my sin or blame someone else, when I wanna do that, I wanna go, whoa, God, I want your mercy and your kindness to be on my sin. And because of Jesus, he has been very kind and very merciful and very gracious for all of my sin, for all of my mistakes. Well, again, I said it, I think there's an election coming up on Tuesday or something like that, a big day. Oh wait, it's not, that's not an important day. It's, it's my daughter's birthday, November 5th. That's what it is. But a lot of people will be celebrating for Addie on November 5th. But there will also be a secondary important thing, an election. I don't really like to jump into this. I heard someone once say, the way to run a party is talk about politics. So I thought I'd just take a few moments to run a good party. Because church is always a celebration and it's always a party. When we vote, which you should vote, I personally believe a lot of people have sacrificed so that you could vote. Thank you for the men and women who serve our country, our great nation. A lot of people paid a great price so that we can vote. I believe that you should vote. I believe you should vote just to honor those people. And all the people, thank you, they'll be running all of the, the polls across the globe so thankful I don't have that job. <sighs> you know. But we're gonna vote. We're not voting for a savior. We're voting for a political candidate. Jesus is our savior. And the hope for our nation, sorry, Republicans, is not Donald Trump. Sorry, Democrats, it's not Kamala Harris. The hope for our nation is Jesus Christ and his lordship, his reigning. Yep. We pray for both of them. I sincerely do. I pray for both of them. That they have such an unbelievable encounter with Jesus Christ that it would change the course of our nation for the good. And so we're not voting for them to save us because that job's already been done. And we also know that Jesus is Lord today. He will be Lord on Tuesday and he will be Lord on Wednesday. And the book of Daniel tells me God will allow who he wants to allow. Yet we also get to play a part in that. And so one couple things I've just noticed is people will say, well, I can't vote for her or him because, man, they're just, 
they have these flaws. They have all these things that they said or, or did. And I just want to ask you, are you really that self-righteous to call out every one of their flaws? Look in the mirror, guy, girl. You've got a lot of flaws as well. I just think there's a lot of Christians who need to step off their high horse, step down a little bit, and ask for the mercy of God for both of them and themselves. And so while we're not really voting for a king, we are voting for someone who will create policies. And if we care about people, we want policies that are gonna put Christ's followers in the best position to live the life that God wants them to live. And so I wanna ask you a few questions from the Bible because King Josiah, he found the book, he read the book, and he did what it says. And I think if you're a Christ follower, I think you have to seriously ask yourself a couple of questions. I think you have to ask yourself, number one, do you stand with God's people, the nation of Israel? Go back to Genesis chapter 12. God told Abraham, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. The church should be standing with the nation of Israel and God's people. If you read the book of Revelation, the people who diss God's people, it ain't good for them. I'm not saying Israel's perfect, because America ain't perfect. But I do know, I think we should be asking ourselves, hey, do, are, we, are we gonna stand with God's people? I'm gonna stand with God's people. I'm gonna go what the book says. It's very clearly. Some of you are like, oh no, he's gonna endorse someone, he's gonna endorse someone, I know it. Jeremiah chapter one, verse five. You knew me in my mother's womb. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I am fearfully and wonderfully made. I think we have to ask ourselves, are we standing for the unborn, life? The gods of the Old Testament, lowercase g, are the same gods that are ruling our world today. I mean, that we would take an innocent life. And again, I actually believe that. I believe we've had the cure for so many things. I believe we've had unbelievable inventions and dreams. One day when we see heaven, we'll meet all these people, these millions of innocent little lives that were taken from the womb, that have been aborted. And if someone of you ever had an abortion, hey, the grace of God is there for you. The mercy of God is there for you. Forgiveness is there for you. People have dealt with so much guilt. And I believe that when a little one loses their life or it's taken from them, I believe they're in the arms of Jesus. I don't say that as some cliche thing. I believe absent of the body is to be present of the Lord. I believe God loves the little ones. But we need to ask ourselves, hey, what do we believe? Biblically, as a Christ follower. Hey, what do you believe with that? What do you believe about marriage? What do you believe about a husband and a wife? What do you believe about, that's God's plan? What do you believe about religious freedoms? Do you believe that religion and this is the part where it's always hilarious. It's like, oh, separation of church and state. <laughs> separation of church and state. <laughs> what are you talking about? In 1802, the Dansbury Baptist Church wrote to Thomas Jefferson, and they're like, oh, there's a wall. Don't talk about church. Don't talk about state. It's two separate things. No, it was about the government interfering with the church. Hello? Eat some Cracker Jacks and get an espresso shot and actually read the truth. The truth is that it was never meant to be what the crazy woke media has turned it out to be. It's not a separation of church and state. It's that the government cannot infiltrate and reflect and tell the church what to do. We have religious freedoms. Last time I checked in 1776, I think that's one of the big reasons we came to America. And so we have to ask ourselves these questions. And however you vote, God's grace upon you. When I walk into that voting booth, I'm gonna ask the mercy of God, the will of God. I'm gonna cast a vote. Jesus is already the Lord, but I'm gonna create, I'm gonna cast a vote for things that I go, whoa, who's gonna align with this book the best? And I encourage you to do the same. For some who are just, if you're also like me, you're like, oh, please, can this be over? There's got to be something else. I mean, anybody else, come on, can this be over? You know what I'm saying? And guess what? Just a side note, four years from now, it will be the most important election <laughs> of your lifetime. And eight years from now, it will be, if you thought eight years ago was the most important election, this is the most important election. No, the most important election is when God's people find the book, read the book, do what it says daily. That's what's gonna change our world. And so we've gotta ask ourselves, God, are we gonna do that? Because Christianity will exist without America, but America will not exist without Christianity. And so we get to choose. Will we find this book? Will we read it? Will we do what it says? My final verse, 
2 Kings 23, verse 25, this is what they said about Josiah, and my prayer is they'll say something like this about you one day. Never before had there been a king like Josiah who turned to the Lord with all of his heart, all of his soul, all of his strength, obeying all the law of Moses. And there's never been a king like him since. What one sense will they say about your one and only life? Billy Graham, the great pastor, preacher, he said, for nations to get back on their knees, paraphrasing, for nations to get back on their feet, they've actually got to get and hit their knees. And that's what we're going to do today. We're going to close out and worship because I believe that the church is actually the hope of the world. Jesus is the Savior of the world. And so as you go on Tuesday and you celebrate my daughter's birthday, thank you all across America, those online who will be celebrating my daughter's 19th birthday and the other event on November 5th. Hey, we pray. Would you out with me and pray? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for your truth. Lord, maybe someone here today, they would ask themselves the question, God, where are they with you? Have they really cast the ballot of salvation? Have they really turned to themselves, turned to you for their sins? And Father, if they haven't, I pray today in this moment, they would draw near to you. Because God, when we draw near to you, you draw near to us. And so if you'd just be honest and say, I need God in my life. Where I am, God sees you, he knows you, he cares about you. And I wanna give you the opportunity to turn to him. It's about humbling yourself. Josiah humbled himself and turned to God and said, God, what do we need to do? We found this book, we're reading this book, now we gotta do what it says. The Bible that says that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord would be saved. And so if you need to make sure that you're right with God, know that your sins have been forgiven, know that you have eternal salvation, that's heaven one day, but also know that you have this one and only life to make a difference for God. If you need to do that right where you are, just make this your prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to die on a cross for me. God, I believe in you that 2,000 years ago, you died, you were buried, and you rose again. And so I give my life to you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Lead us all the days of our lives. If you're praying that prayer and you'd like me to include you and just say, God, I wanna make sure I'm right with you. Would you just lift up your hand real quick? God sees you. Thank you for your honesty. Father, you see many today that are just turning back to you. Just say, Jesus, invade my life. Be the Lord of my life. God, we thank you for those that are making a decision. We know that all of heaven is celebrating. And Lord, we're cheering them on. But Lord, we also take a moment just to pray for our nation. Would you just stand to your feet for a moment? Maybe put your hand over your heart. If you wanna kneel, kneel. I'm gonna kneel, I'm gonna pray for our, for our country. And let's ask God to do what only he could do. Father, we love you. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for Jesus Christ. You said in your word, 2 Chronicles seven fourteen, that if my people who are called by my name would seek my face, turn from their sin, that God, you would heal our land. So Lord, we repent of our sins. We repent of our self-righteousness, our arrogance. God, we don't have it all together. Lord, we have so many flaws and so many faults, but Lord, your grace is there. You provide us forgiveness. You take away all of our guilt and all of our shame. And so today, Lord, we humble ourselves. We lift up these candidates. We pray for them. We pray, God, your mercy on them, your mercy on our country, on our nation. Lord, forgive us so many times where we failed. Lord, we wanna stand with your people. Lord, we wanna love your people. And God, we want to be a part of the church, which is the hope of the world, sharing the greatest message ever, that Jesus Christ is the Savior. Lord, we love you. We give you all the praise, give you all the glory. We thank you, God, that you're the king today. You're the king on Tuesday. You're the king on Wednesday. Lord, you're the king of kings, the Lord of lords. We honor you. We celebrate you. We love you. We're thankful that you died on a cross 2,000 years ago, that you're the living, reigning, saving king. And Lord, would you use us to read your book when we find your book and do what it says. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Hey, come on, how many of you are thankful for Jesus?